Welcome to Italian American Writers and Short Stories, a conversation about the Feast of Narrative anthology series. Uh, with me, I have Mr. DeSena, uh, and you know just a little bit about him. You might know him already if you've uh, if you've worked with him, but if not, he is the editorial director of Lydia Magazine since 1990, as well as the founder and editor in chief of the Opera My Love Magazine. He is a published author of uh, several stories, including Caro Fantasi, published by Script and Press, Donia Flor, an opera by Niccolo von Westerhout, uh, published by Idea Publications, as well as Sunny Days and Sleepless Nights, Federico Tosti, Poeta Anti-Regime, and The World as an Impression, published by Idea Press, uh, as well as being the editor for these three anthologies and or yeah, for these three anthologies and co-editor of a four-volume series on the composer Niccolo Van Westerhout. Uh, he's the editor of various books, both in Italian and English, published by Idea Press and the translator of the libretti and all informational texts and in music books by the same publisher. Their historical books uh, never been published before and present a unique occasion to the public to access, you know, newly found information. And, oh, he's an editor and publisher of Idea Press, uh, your article and you have articles on Italian traditions, art and music, as well as your articles on Italian Americans are aimed at divulging to the greater public the importance of Italians in the American society, as much as to focus on the difficulties Italians has had to face and overcome to be part of this nation. Uh, you were awarded the Globo Tri Globe, yeah, Globo Tricolor Award for your outstanding work in the publishing industry and for your journalistic work, considered the Italian Oscar of the publishing industry. And in the same year, you were asked by the city of Yonkers to read poems at the 9-11 Memorial Ceremony. Uh, you were presented with the Italian American Personality of the Year Award by the Associazione Culturale Pugliase Maria SS Adolorata in Brooklyn. Uh, I do not speak Italian, so I'm doing my best well, on these it's Italian Heritage Month, so this is part mm -hmm. of the process. <laughs> Good, a little practice, a little fun. Uh, and you are the winner of the 2019 Sons of Italy, Italy Literacy Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Italian Charities of America. So uh, I'm going to pass the mic to you and with all of your great accomplishments, kick off the next part of this uh, discussion. Thank you. As you heard from my from your presentation, there's a lot of Italian in it. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the emphasis is Italian Heritage Month. Anyway, one of the main objectives of Idea Press is to make the work of Italian and Italian American writers more recognized and accessible. And we have achieved that by publishing new and established authors in professional and aesthetically pleasant tones, giving numerous workers book presentations and getting their work reviewed. It is understood that our intention is to offer pleasing books, both in content and appearance, and we have done that. I felt that an anthology of short stories by Italian American writers would complement our already fruitful editorial experience by proposing a taste of the excellent writing that our Italian American community offers. At first, I contacted the writers that I had already published. And then I realized that Iowa, that Italian American Writers Association, of which I was a member, did not publish an anthology of its own and contacted them. An extension to a group of writers from Staten Island completed my search. After a preliminary selection, I decided the stories I had examined would, give, would suffice to give a sample picture of the Italian American writers of the tri-state area. When I started with the first Italian American writers anthology, I was delighted to see that most writers realized this was an effort on my part to focus on our own ethnic groups copious literary production and participated enthusiastically. And this is for volume one, mainly. Uh, things change along the line, things developed, and let me read you the continuation. Until recently, no spotlight has been put on them as a group specifically. And I believe and still do that more of these projects should be initiated and supported by the various Italian American associations. It is after all a tenet of most these organizations to assist in their own kind in cultural activities. Somehow though, I don't see it happen that often. 
and it's disappointing to realize that there is no awareness of this need to promote our writers, artists, dramatists, and composers, so they may leave a mark on their own. Mm. We do have, I got to say one thing, uh, participation toward poets. They do have anthologies for poets, uh, mm. but not, not more than that. Anthologies is just one of the tools to allow writers to be known, but they are much more because they allow writers to belong to a group of chosen people like themselves, people who enthusiastically write because they want to and believe their innermost feelings need to be shared, at least on paper. It makes them realize that regardless of whether their name is famous or not, they were chosen to be part of something that makes them shine just as much as the other contributors. Mm -hmm. The copious number of these contributors to volume two made it impossible to fit them all in tome of less than 300 pages. And I didn't want to have uh, anthology one to be a certain number of pages and anthology two to be double the size. But therefore, we created a volume three, which was published a very short time after. Now, let's talk about volume one. The first collection of short stories aimed at presenting the richness of styles and creativity of Italian American writers of the tri state area, that is New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, for the readers who are not accustomed to this term. The participants have demonstrated amply through the years, and some, for one reason or the other, may have gone unnoticed by the large public or not sufficiently promoted. The writers chosen by me to be included in the first anthology are from a wide range of professional backgrounds, but ultimately most of them are published authors with an extensive experience on their curricula, as the reader may infer from their biographies. Altogether, the stories that appear in this anthology explore different topics, some of them typical of the Italian American world, while others universal, offering a gamut of styles and approaches to writing that proves, that proves the existence of a vast group of Italian American writers who deserve recognition for their work. Now, let me give you some statistics from volume one. Nine stories are nonfiction, 14 stories are fiction. There is a total of 19 authors. One of the authors present, Linda Ann Loschiamo, appears with three stories. Volume two and three, the additional details in this volume two and three that distinguish them from volume one is that the participants are from the corner, from all corners of the United States, which was the original goal of this project. I also like to take the occasion to thank the Organization of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America, their national magazine, Italian American, which cooperated in the advertisement of this project, allowing us to reach a wider audience. These anthologies contain a very interesting amalgam of different stories and authors. What is common, other than they're belonging to the same ethnic group, is the validity of their content and the message they send to the readers. Some stories are funny commentaries on social gatherings of some kind, wakes included, while others address different topics with a more somber tone, such as war events, the constant search for our roots, the changing of neighborhoods, the COVID-19 crisis, and so on. Regardless of the topic, these writers prove that passion for writing is another element they have in common with each other. Let me give you some statistics regarding volume two. There are a total of 27 authors with a story each. All of them are nonfiction stories. Four authors are also published in anthology one. They are Elizabeth Vallone, Linda Enloschiavo, Mike Fiorito, and Leo Vadala. Some statistics regarding volume three. There's a total of 24 authors with a story each, all of them nonfiction. Seven authors are also in volume two. Cecilia Gigliotti, Joe Giordano, Tomalos Cicero, Maria Massimi, Marco Spano, and the authors that are present in all three anthologies, that is Mike Fiorito and Leo Vadala. I would like to mention at this point some information about our authors. There's Cavaliere Gilles de Battaglia Rogo Baldassari, it just is a Jefferson Award for Lifetime Achievement winner, besides having spearheaded the development of the universality of Italian heritage curriculum. Idea Press published her memoir, Gilda Promise Me. Michael Cotillo is the executive editor of Finger Lake Times and a columnist for the Golden Lion. He published also one book with Idea Press. 
Maria Teresa de Donato is an accomplished journalist and naturopath, naturopath with many books to her name. Maria de la Ventura is the author of Life After Loss, Healing Piece by Piece. Mike Fiorito is currently an associate editor for Mads World Magazine and a regular contributor to Red Hook Star Review. In 2019, he was nominated for the Pushcart Prize and is the author of six books. Julian Forgione is professional writing consultant at the Passion Institute of Technology and an ELL, ES, ESL teacher. Sorry. La Laura Di Liberto Clincon is the author of nu numerous poetry books and translated collection from English to, into Italian. Maria Lisella is a sixth Queen's Poet Laureate, has been nominated various times for the Pushcart Prize and is the author of many books, besides being the New York expert for USA Today and a contributor to the Jerusalem Post and La Voce di New York. Linda Anloschiavo has won numerous awards in poetry contests and published many, many poetry chapbooks. She's the English language director of Lydia Magazine. Andrew Paul Mele is the author of seven books and is columnist for the Italian Tribune and the Staten Island Advance. Mariana Randazzo has won the Sanso Vito Literary Award and has published seven books. Mary Roro, a psychiatrist trained at Harvard University, received the Jefferson Award and was nicknamed the Violin Doc for her ability with the viola, used to assist in the healing of patients. She's published in numerous journals. Tim Tomlinson is the co-founder of the New York Writers' Workshop, teaches at New York University and is the author of two books. Elizabeth Vallone is the author of four books and a contributor to Lydia Magazine. Jose Cachibauda is the author of eight books. David Jacobi is a teacher and an advocate for the homeless. Fred Gardafé is a distinguished professor of English at Queens College and the John Calandra Italian America Institute. He is the author of numerous books, the co-editor of Voices in Italian Americana and the editor of the Italian American Culture Series at State University of New York. Edward Marucci is the author of 14 books. Professor Emeritus of the Rochester Institute of Technology and a winner of the Sons of Italy Literary Award. Susanna Rosa Molino is the author of two books and the director of the Promotion Center for Little Italy in Baltimore. Marge Pellegrino is an award-winning author and teaching artist. She's the author of five books and the reception, recipient of the Coming Up Toller Award bestowed upon her by then First Lady Barbara Bush. Anadora Perillo has won several awards for poetry. Her book was a finalist for the Hicking Group Foundation, James Fellowship for the Novel. Elizabeth Primamore, author of two books, is a recipient, recipient of the Bernard and Shirley Handel Playwriting Award and was a semi-finalist for the Eugene O'Neill National Playwright Conference. Tony Reitano is the author of three stage radio plays. Michael Ricards is the author of 20 books, 50 verse plays, and a play on the well-known Italian-American poet John Chardy. He has been a college president, a NEH fellow at Princeton University, and a Fulbright fellow in Japan. Award-winning author Paul Salsini has written all, all uh, set in Tuscany, all of eight books. He's the author of numerous books. Sorry, I'm reading something that I'm not supposed to be reading. <laughs> he received the 2011 Sons of Italy Leonardo da Vinci Award for Excellent in Literature. Max Pano is both an award-winning writer and a filmmaker. His award-winning feature documentary is entitled Sicily, Land of Love and Strife. Anthony Valerio is the author of 10 books and was a teacher in Trinity University. Cynthia Adams is the author of six books. Robert Trotter is the author of two novels. And so is Steven Siciliano. Steve Piacente is an award-winning writer who teaches writing at the American University. Angela Bomber teaches in the English Department of the College in San Francisco. And George Giordano is the author of many books, among them the Anthony Provati Thriller series. So as you can see, there are, uh, they, you know, all the other participants who I didn't name, and I'm sorry if I, if I uh, skip some of them, is they, they had um, you know, stories published in magazines, or they had one book published. But I wanted to show that, um, these are all people that have already a foot in the door. They already mm -hmm. found a way to be published to prove their work. But mm -hmm. for some for some 
strange reason, no one has been pushing them as a whole, as Italian Americans. Anyway, I would like at this point to read one of the short stories. It's a very brief short story. And it's by Marilyn Antonucci. And I'm going to put my glasses on because otherwise you're gonna hear a lot more stumbling than before. Frankie should, should have opened the door into Joy's place. Sleigh bells jingled when he slammed down the bit of Chicago wind. The bells were Joy's only concession to the season. If a guy didn't count the aluminum tree stuck in the corner of the joint. Decked out in sapphire balls, the tree sprung to life a couple of weeks in December when Joy plugged in the revolving collar wheel to illuminate the silver needles. At two in the afternoon, the unlit tree kept a forlorn vigil. Joy looked up from behind the bar. A mirror reflected his snowy head and the crisp white shirt stretched across his beefy back. Joy greeted him with a predictable, hey, paisano, come stai? Frankie just blew into his arthritic fingers and dropped on a worn leather bar stool. Give me a cup of coffee, he said. I got this chill I can't shake. The bartender put down his knife, pushed the sli sliced limes into a neat pile and wiped his hands on a clean white half apron tied around his ample girth. Joy filled the coffee grinder with beans. The aroma wafted the length of the bar, but frankly, Frankie seemed oblivious. Guys from the old days didn't come here to drink Java, and he wondered what was eating his friend. Joy placed a steaming cup in front of Frankie and went about his business, prepping for the hip Friday night crowd. They started drifting in a couple of years ago from the renovated Hyde Park neighborhoods. Oh my God, one of the young lawyers shrieked when she spotted the aluminum tree. Dude, that is so retro. The savvy bartender played along and the tree stayed up year round. Hell, he didn't care how the six figured crowd saw his rundown joint. As long as Joy's place was another awesome discovery, maybe he could hang on until social security kicked in. He sliced lemon garnish, then grabbed two white plastic buckets, filled them with mini ice cubes from the big freezer and dumped them into chillers of the bar. Frankie jerked up. Remember Johnny? He used to come in here a few times a year with his old lady, Margie, and, and tell you how to make a bracciole like he invented it? Yeah, tall guy, wore glasses. Gave me a recipe for broccoli and olive oil that was damn good on linguine. That's the guy who died, what, what, a couple of weeks ago now, right? Asked Joe. Yeah, that's the guy I'm talking about. Johnny and me go way back to when we were in school at Santa Luisius, hammered each other pretty good on the playground. I seen him around once in a while, mostly running to him here drinking with Margie. Joey opened a jar of stuffed jumbo green olives and spooned them into a stainless steel container next to lemons and limes. He refilled Frankie's cup and twisted open the economy sized jar of maraschino cherries. You know how as it was in Florida seeing the grandkids? Joey nodded and hoped Frankie wasn't going to start in about his ex. Well, anyways. I'm going to Fort Myers, and when you get back, I'm glancing through the orbits, you know, the obituaries from the paper stacked up. What do I do? But Johnny, or what do I see? I see that Johnny died. They got himself cremated. So today I figure it's cold as hell. Maybe I'll take me a quick stroll over to pay my respect to the widow. Maybe I'll get a cup of coffee and some of those Polish cookies she bakes. You know how it is this time of year, Joy. You know, Christmas cookies in the house now that the ex is out of the door. The bartender rolled his eyes and wished he had a buck for every set sack he had listened for over the years. Frankie might head down that beaten path and be bowling when the paying customers started rolling in. Joy polished the beer glass and diverted the sub story. So did you go to Johnny's? I'm dressed for paying respect, ain't I? Frankie said, glancing in the mirror and straightening it out his skewered tie. So I knocked on the door and before you know, I'm sitting in Johnny's kitchen. We nod Johnny, a mug of strong coffee, and a plate loaded with goodies shoved in front of me. Margie pours out her heart to me, Joy. Tell me, one day Johnny is doing radiation for the big C, and the next day he's gone. Breaks my heart, I tell her. Shame you and Johnny didn't see more of each other, she says, and walks out of the room. 
I'm thinking maybe it was time to get my head and get out of there. But she comes back with a couple of old school pictures. She pours me more coffee and we stared at me and Johnny and about 30 other delinquents lined up behind the nuns. Well, we're just sitting there at the table crying like babies when she grabs my hand and pulls me into the bedroom. Joy Shaggy Brown's brows arched over his wire rim glasses. He stopped chewing and the maraschino stem came to a halt between his generous lips. Frankie made a fluttering motion over his heart. I am telling you, pal, I was waiting for my anjama, angina to come calling. Jeez, you never take Johnny's wife for that time, but doesn't interrupt Frankie's version of an old story. See, my mind is spinning about how I'm going to get myself out of this mess when Margie points to the bed. I still sleep with my Johnny every night, she says to me. I'm looking at the bed, and all I see is one of those teddy bears with a hard stitch on his chest that says, be mine. Kind of sweet, I'm thinking, except is this damn bear is wearing a big pair of glasses. Johnny's glasses, she says. Joey tossed the bar to towel over his shoulder and muttered, no shit, no shit, repeats Frankie. So I'm coming down and thinking, maybe it's kind of romantic that she cuddles up next to a teddy bear in the middle of the night when I notice this bear sitting on top of a gray box, if you catch my drift. Joyce nodded, are you bullying me, Frankie? And waited for a punchline to a bad joke. Frankie ignored the interruption. See, I'm just trying to figure if maybe it's okay for a bear to be wearing a dead guy's glasses and sleep with his widow. Whatever works, you know, whatever I mean, you know what I mean. Hell, I slept with my arms wrapped around Gina's pillow for months after she left. I'm just saying. The bears wearing Johnny's glasses and sitting on his box of ashes confirms the skeptical bartender. I told you what I've seen. I'm telling you, Joy, it was disturbing. What the hell goes on in here? I'm thinking to myself when she tells me how she sleeps like a baby every night and me, I'm pulling my tie loose so I can get some air. You ain't making this up, are you, Frankie? Cause you know I, how I feel about being taken for a ride. Frankie right hand, shot toward the tin ceiling, swear on my mother's grave. An icy blast off Lake Michigan rattled the front door. A soft jingle pierced the silent room. Joy shook off the chill and walked over to the aluminum Christmas tree. He polished his, each pane of the color wheel and plugged it into the wall. The tree sprang to life as, his, as each tint washed over the metallic needles. Frankie swiveled around on a bar stool while Joy poured them shut. They stand as the miniature stained glass window spun and the tree evolved into the blue, then red, then green, then gold. Joy lifted the string. Salute, Giovanni. Riposa in pace, echoed Frank. Joy poured another round and brushed away what he hoped was powered sugar on Frankie's lapel. Now, as you, as you can see from this story, um, it's a way of looking at death and mourning and wakes. Uh, funny perspective, you know, making fun of ourselves in a way. So that's, you know, I would say that that is a typical story. There's many of them, uh, you know, actually many of them about uh, wakes and funerals, and they see them in very, very, very funny way. The word back to you, Alison. Yeah, no, thank you for that uh, for that reading. I would say I've gotten the opportunity to read a few of the stories in volume one, particularly. And going back to what you said, that a lot of the stories are very like close to home in a lot of ways, like dealing with death, memories of family, um, reflections on like life, like uh, the, like I was gonna say life and death, but you know that's that's what it is, isn't it? Um, and very funny, very honest conversations, both fiction and nonfiction stories. There's this very like, intimate quality to a lot of the stories that I think uh, really comes across, and it's it's an amazing collection. And you know, uh, we all we do have all three of these books at the Crestwood Library. If anyone's interested in getting them through the library system, taking a read, obviously getting a hand on their own copy if they wanted to. Um, and yeah, and even 
going back to your introduction before that this is a, uh, the this anthology series is a great way to bring authors who have published one book, published many books of different uh, levels of experience, but who are accomplished authors in their own rights and creating that community and that tool to promote their work and the Italian American experience and the human experience too. And I think that reading uh, reflected that, that comedy, that conversation, um, in a uh, really, really interesting way, really good way. Uh, I want to open the, if anyone has any, like, you know, comments, reflections on how they felt about the reading, different ways they might have connected to it. Uh, if anyone has anything they want to say, I believe we can do like a hand raising in the Zoom room. I'm not too sure. Uh, Z might be able to speak. Yeah, more you can that. either mm -hmm. raise your hand or you can write in the chat. Or mm -hmm. you could see if anybody else is unmuting and otherwise mm -hmm. unmute yourself. No one has anything to say? Yeah. Anything at all, even just a, hey, I liked it, you know, just a little conversation. Would you want uh, this point, uh, since we, we do have uh, some of the writers uh, mm -hmm. from this anthology present here, you, would you want to a couple of them to say something? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. But I am seeing uh, Marianne in the Zoom is raising her hand. Did you uh, want to, I, I see you're unmuted. So, you know, whatever you want to say, uh, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to say thank you for this. And uh, hey, I liked it. <laughs> it's a very compelling uh, reading and I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, you definitely got into the voices of the characters, which I think really also helped bring it to life, the, the style of the writing and uh, definitely a very good reading. Uh, if there's no, also in the chat as well, someone said they enjoyed it very much. Uh, and then, yeah, it absolutely, we have some, a lot, a few of the authors here today. Uh, I think I'd like to start with uh, Patricia Edick, if that's all right. Uh, her story, uh, is a converse, uh, a conversation with a stranger is in volume two, I believe as well. And, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, which volumes these stories were from if people wanted to read them specifically, uh, and give her, pass her the virtual mic to talk a little bit about herself and her work. Yes. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. And, um, I'm astounded and truly honored that I'm even included in this. Um, I've written, my whole life, but for myself. And it's uh, to it just found it very rewarding. I've not been published and uh, this is my first. And I am grateful for the opportunity that Mr. Dasana has uh, given me. And I, I saw the ad in the uh, well, Sire magazine and I sent in my story and, and it's published. It's very, very different from, I think probably most of the stories in the uh, book, it's, a fiction story, but it's based on something that happened in 2009. I originally wrote this story in 2009, and then I updated it in 2020 when I presented it for publication. And most of you probably remember that in 2009, there was a virus. It was called the uh, pig virus. And they were saying that people were coming in contact with pigs and they were getting sick. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what was going on. People were afraid, they didn't know what to do. And some countries actually slaughtered all their pigs thinking that's the solution. Of course, it wasn't the solution. Did eventually come up with like a flu uh, vaccine. This virus is back this year. And uh, I also noted this year, there are other viruses that are coming back. And the flu virus is very active in a lot of countries. And I don't know if you heard, they've slaughtered a lot of poultry. So they gave me the idea that uh, what if this was an opportunity for a demon to um, come to earth and use this confusion and, and to get farmers to actually kill their own stock. And then we'd have, an op we'd have a problem with food source. So it's biblical, it's, it's Nostradamus, it's a lot of things put together because I, I had Catholic teachings. So I did learn about the fallen angels 
and how they were thrown down to earth by God and they would like to get back. Now, the fallen angel, of course, is Satan, the demon, the devil, and he has an army. And his army here on the earth uh, are going about to find people who are open to the opportunity to get something that they don't have. So it's also based on greed. So he goes to people knowing beforehand because he's, he's the general and his scouts already are out and know what these people want and what, what the sadness they feel and, and what they desire. And he goes in and he presents them with like the Godfather, uh, an offer you can't refuse because it is so good. So it's basically, that's what it is. And what happens when, when man, because of his greed, foregoes uh, what is right. And uh, eventually though, they don't realize that they have a um, contract with the devil because the way he presents it is they think I have nothing to lose because he's not asking for anything. But what he's asking for is your soul. And part of the story of the demon being thrown down to earth is that he's envious of man because man has free will, man has a soul, and man has domain over the animals. So that all comes into play. Uh, so that's basically what this story is about. It's entirely different. It has nothing to do with Italian. Uh, it's, it's my imagination, which I've always had. And I, always, and I remember as a child reading H.G. Uh, Wells, and I loved his writings. And I just went with it and to see where it would go. So that's a little bit and about me and, and my story. Yeah. No, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, like you said, just the that your story is focusing on this virus that, you know, with the COVID pandemic and even in the past, like the SARS, SARS virus, uh, the swine flu, like you said, this fear and confusion that often is bred during these times of like health public crises. Um, and mixing that in with like you said like the story like catholic hit the catholic lore of you know fallen angels demons taking advantage of that fear and confusion um how would you say like you know was revisiting the story if you wrote in 2009 how was it revisiting it in 2020 for publication was there you know did you find so a lot of it rang true or did you come in with a different approach well, I, I wrote an introduction to the story uh, where mm -hmm. I brought in, uh, I don't want to be political, but there was a question about who was the president of the United States, who's very, very different, controversial, mm -hmm. and uh, people were bringing up Hitler again. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was references in, my, in the beginning of my story to the orange man, the gray mm -hmm. man, the uh, tan man, the woman in the white, in the big house, Mm -hmm. But you use your own imagination and your knowledge of who these people might be. Now, mm -hmm. someone in my family read the story, only read it as a story. Mm -hmm. uh, another person read it and the demons that they pictured, not Hitler, someone else. So, so I wanted people to use their own minds, their own imaginations mm -hmm. and bring in what they believed. And uh, I read it recently at the Long Island Writers Group um, workshop. And one person got the biblical implications and I'm not sure everyone did. They just think it's a story. Um, but with COVID, there was so much confusion and also there was, uh, there was uh, theories of uh, the government was fooling us. There is no virus. Uh, they're looking to just control us, they're keeping us isolated. So th that played into it, yeah. yes, when I rewrote it. And also when I wrote it in 2009, I referred to Iraq so this time I took out the reference to Iraq. I changed it a little bit to be more current. Yeah. Yeah, well, even like you said, that people can interpret it in different ways. It's a story that I'm sure like whatever time period you're reading it, in, you're getting something different out of it. And everyone's own experience is going to pull different things out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely a very interesting story. Someone in the chat has also said reflection of society and how uh, where we are at any point in time when you read that story, how it reflects back. Uh, does anyone else have any questions, comments that they want to uh, ask Patricia while we have her? Uh, Elizabeth, are you raising your hand? Yes. Uh, let's see. Are you able to unmute yourself so we can hear? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, Patricia, I uh, really enjoyed 
uh, what you were saying about your uh, short story. And it also, I have to thank you because uh, I have a story I wanted to submit to Tiziano that's uh, a bit of a horror story. And I just felt, ah, maybe I should go with something else. <laughs> when I heard your story, I said, oh, okay, so mine's not so bad. <laughs> uh, the second thing I wanted to say, I wanted to thank Tiziano immensely for what he does for Italian American writers mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, political climate we have today where they want to get rid of Columbus. Um, I enjoy reading or well, hearing the uh, story that Tiziano read because it's in a voice that is slowly disappearing. Uh, as you know, the years go by, um, like the young people, I, I don't know how much they would know about the way people interacted and spoke to one another. And um, having these stories in the anthology, uh, I think really helps um, passing it along to the next generation so they can have some understanding of what their parents and grandparents' lives were like and how they communicated with one another. So uh, Tiziano, I thank you very much. You're welcome. And I would like to just uh, add something about uh, Patricia's story. You know, the beauty of the fact that you can reread the story and find different things in it, mm -hmm. that makes it such a successful story because she's able, you know, it's just as ugly as when you see a movie and then you see two years after, says, oh, I didn't notice that. All the details come out to life when you reread the story. I, you know, I read it a few times because of the editing process and the correction and all that. And it, every time I, I saw the subtleties, you know, the little, the little nuances that give extra meaning to whatever's going on. And that's, that's a successful story, you know. I, an outsider would never know that you were the first, you, you, this was your first story to be published, mm -hmm. you know. It's, uh, you're one of the few on top of that that, that has, their story published for the first time. So you should be very proud that people have that uh, response reading your story. That means you achieved the purpose of writing that short story. So, uh, you know, particular applause yeah. from me as an editor. And I actually enjoyed reading your story and all the other stories because they're all so different from each other. And just like Elizabeth Ballon says, a lot of them, uh, not in your case, in your case is specific here, but a lot of them carry information in it mm -hmm. that is based on, on personal experience. So people that are, have been around more than half a century and therefore carry things that uh, carry information and things, feelings, emotions, everything packaged of, of a life that is disappearing because mm -hmm. every generation, and this is history, it's not only now, because mm -hmm. they, we always claim it's now, and it's always been like that. Every generation carries a different package of information with them. And if we don't write it down, that disappears. And that is the worst thing that can happen because we are only memories. And if we take that out, we're gone. And these writers have found a way to bring this information to the people. And this is, this is what's important, you know? Yeah. Back to you, Alison. Yeah, absolutely. Just echoing what you said that, you know, history and culture and community can really, uh, they come through in the narratives we share. And by having this anthology and preserving those narratives, you're preserving that culture and history and the way we communicate and the way we share stories. Uh, so absolutely, uh, Patricia, wonderful story. Hopefully this is the first of many stories you get to publish, I'm sure. Uh, and I want to uh, pass the mic to one of the other authors we have, being cognizant of time, but thank you for sharing uh, and being here tonight. Uh, we also have uh, Joe Giordano, who is as, in our prior introduction, Mr. Senna said is author of many published books, and I'd like to give him the opportunity to talk a little bit uh, about himself and introduce himself. Let's see. 
Okay. I think you're okay. with the microphone. I think, uh, I think I'm muted. There we go. There we go. Great. We hear you now. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for having me. And uh, I want to say about that uh, Christmas story, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, I've decided to uh, purchase a teddy bear for my wife, you know, just in case. <laughs> Uh, well, my work is, uh, of course, based as, as many of the other authors listening in on my observations and experience. And uh, one of the stories that was in the, the first story that was in the anthology was uh, Requiem for Guido. And early in my career, a senior Italian executive uh, uh, took me under his wing and uh, uh, was very helpful. Uh, over the decades that passed, uh, we lost contact. And uh, on a trip that I uh, planned to take to Italy, I contacted a mutual friend and uh, sadly learned that, uh, that the gentleman had, uh, had just passed away. And so a Requiem for Guido is really about those things that uh, you wish you had said, but now it's uh, too late to say them. Um, the other story that I wrote uh, was actually a little bit of inspired by my uh, novel, if I may plug it, Birds of Passage, an Italian immigrant coming of age story um, available on Amazon. Uh, one of the characters uh, uh, in the story, in the, in the novel, uh, committed murder and, and escaped to the United States. And the thought occurred to me that there were probably some number of uh, Italians that left Italy under a shadow. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they, when they came to the United States, they had family and children and grandchildren. Uh, the entire uh, turn of their family uh, was uh, ironically because of some perhaps illegal act in Italy. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, uh, I would say in the great majority of cases, people had extremely successful uh, families turned because of that uh, fateful uh, act in Italy that caused them to, to leave and come to the United States. So the, the immigrant's grandson is about uh, a, a person who realized that they've been successful in the United States, and it was because of something that, you know, as is many of the cases with families, uh, if there was some shadow on uh, <laughs> the circumstances of uh, why their, their grandparents, say, or parent came to the United States, it, the, the, the story is not 100% clear. And so he contacts the remaining family that he has in Italy and, and uh, go visits them uh, with one of the prime purposes being to try to learn more about what really happened. And uh, as the story relates, he has a surprising result. Anyway, those are, uh, those are the two stories and I very much appreciate uh, them being published. Any questions or comments? Uh, kind of just reflecting on what you said, uh, immigration, the, like immigration is a huge part of, I'd say like the Italian American like experience in the history of the culture of, you know, coming from Italy for any variety of reasons. Um, how would you say, to, like, I'm trying to think how to word this, how is that aspect, how, how did that influence your process of writing that second story that you said? I, I can't recall the title exactly. Off well, my, head. My, 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 uh, my grandparents and my father were immigrants and I grew up with immigrants. Mm -hmm. And uh, as was implied earlier, you know, uh, mm -hmm. one of the elements when, when we're gone is that um, the direct firsthand experience of, uh, of those people uh, will be lost. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, you, 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 you listen and you, uh, I know many people in, in, the, in, in the Italian community that, uh, uh, my grandparents continued to live in. And, and, and of course that influenced uh, what I wrote about. Also in Birds of Passage. Yeah. It allowed Sorry, me to- I wasn't sure to I was cutting you they, off. It, it allowed me to understand how they thought and, and spoke. Yeah. No, absolutely. And how even, I feel like 
this whole conversation, this whole hour we've had is, you know, everything building on top of each other that, you know, the culture and that history of remembering the stories of, you know, parents, grandparents who came before, uh, their stories of immigration, why they came here, preserving that culture and those memories. Uh, definitely really important that you've been able to capture those as well in your stories. Uh, does anyone else have any, you know, questions, comments, things they'd like to share? Uh, Patricia, I'm seeing your hand raised. I do. Oh, as well as uh, Dr. Dr. Roro. Jilda, yes, just Jilda. Jilda, First, Jilda? all right. Kudo to Mr. Tiziano, Mr. Giordano, all of you for your writing, because we are leaving a legacy for this and future generations as to the Italian experience. My generation was the most fortunate because we lived through a time where we experienced the immigrants. And this is something we must codify, so it's serious. Right now, after writing my memoir, Jilda Promised Me, I've been working on with the New Jersey Italian Heritage Commission and with Copo Mayo, the Conference of Presidents of Major Italian American Organizations and the New Jersey Italian, I mean, the New Jersey Department of Education. We've developed a curriculum. It's called the Universality of Italian Heritage. After working for 19 years, finally, this has been discovered by Copo Mayo and now disseminated to every chief school administrator in the United States. What we're doing this year, and I've been chair of this curriculum development committee since 2003, it said we have to memorialize these lessons and convert them into video format that's teacher friendly, more exciting, and let's look at topics that are vital to Italians. Number one, Columbus. Immigration, I said, we can have a video with Columbus in the title. The Department of Education politically will not accept it. And education is this curious hybrid of politics and pedagogy. So I said, let's do it under the rubric of immigration as Mr. Giordano had talked about immigration. The title is An Italian's Dream mm -hmm leads to the origin of the Hispanic peoples and beyond. We start with the four voyages of Columbus, the origin of the Hispanics, because if it weren't for him, there would be no Hispanic people, to present day immigration issues uh, affecting Hispanics, Italians, and others. These things are very important. And in there, we want to have these stories. And you look at our lessons, they're in all subject areas, kindergarten through grade 16. And the videos, the next video we are finalizing right now is Italians and the Holocaust. And what we're doing there, we're focusing a great deal on the role of Pope Pius XII. Remember, they were going to beatify him. And then uh, the controversy, the people who were against said, yes, the Pope did a lot, but he didn't do enough. It was always, he didn't do enough. Well, we're showing now with the secret Vatican um, information that has recently been made public that he did a lot more than people realize. We have to let people know what Italians have done. We have to have our voice in all the schools there is no Italian voice in our curriculum. When you look, when I was growing up, 13 years of schooling, all I ever heard about Italians was in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and Marconi invented the wireless. Now, with our publications and what Tiziano has been doing, you've got some very good material. It's wonderful, but you have to market it more. It's so difficult when these things come out. If we could get Copo Mayo, this umbrella organization of all Italian organizations, and have like a book listing of all Italian American authors, what the, their, the genres and whatever else, if we let people know more and the general public about Italian American authors, 
if we don't market more effectively, it's not going to happen that much. Now I finished my, uh, Tiziano wants to say. Yes, the, the, prob the problem, Gilda, is that uh, as I, you know, member of Sons of Italy and member of other Italian American organization, um, there is no effort on most of these associations to follow up on the cultural part of Italian Americans. And this is the problem. And that's why we keep on going back to the pizza and, you know, the, the mobsters, because we as associations are not concerned about the cultural aspect of our Italian Americans. The composers, we have so many, the highest number of composers for movies or music are Italian. We never talk about it. The writers, poets, dramatists, nobody talks about them. We are not concerned with that. We're concerned about uh, getting together, getting scholarship for the kids, um, getting dinner dances, give each other medals for being good and not being good, but we're not concerned about diffusing this culture, throw it out to people. People, let people know that Italian Americans are achieving in the culture, but associations have to do it too. We, we do it on our own pocket, we as, as publishers, but we're small. We're not Simon and & Schuster, and we can market so much and more unless the association cooperate and help with this. The presentations, the, the sales of the books, and, and in this case, exposing, showing to the world, uh, Joe Giordano, the Patricia, Patricia Eddig, Elizabeth Vallone, Gilda, Gilda Roro Baldessari, all these people exist. Or oh, even me, Tiziano Thomas Tosian, even me, I exist too. Given to the world, Show it to the world because we as associations are not doing the proper work when it comes down to cultural activities. We do it educationally now, but we still are ignoring our cultural pro producers in the society, in American society. The Italian Americans produce a lot, but they are ignored as a group. That's all. Thank you. Well, again, Tiziano, it's well worth the effort because it's very difficult. I'll be the first one to say it, but if you have persistence, things can happen. And I would still suggest that we contact Copo Mayo. I'd be happy to talk to Basil Russo myself, the chairperson, and mention the possibility of just having a list of authors and the books that have been published. You know, US News and World Report just came out with a statement. It said, Italy is the most culturally significant country in the world. It is number one in the world for spreading culture. It is a superpower. We have to build on this. We have to seize the moment. I wrote a short story for the ambassador of Italy to the Dominican Republic. He wrote a beautiful book. It's called... Uh, the Italian legacy in Philadelphia. He said, write a piece for me on the Italian immigrants in Southern New Jersey. So I did. That now, they, sh they had that featured in Rome on the 23rd of September at the American Institute. And on the 3rd of November, they're going to have a, an, ex an exhibit at Temple University on this book. So we can get the word out in so many ways, but all of you people have been writing and what your voice is so important. We should make this available to school districts to let people know what Italian experience has been. And all I'm saying is uh, we should contact these other organizations we have unified all Italians now in the country, all the 58 major Italian American organizations are unified. Why don't we have a unified book list and add to it every month with resources? I think that's a, I, I see no problem in anyone having taking umbrage with doing something like that. So it just gets out to the public, not just Italians, but eventually, hopefully to everyone, that these are Italian authors. So I would suggest, if you'd like, I'll even contact 
Basil Russo and see if he would be interested in doing something like that as part of the Italian American unification process. Well, uh, someone just put uh, a, a note uh, to contact the Generoso Pope Foundation. I, we're going to do that. Uh, the, 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 this is still a local, local effort, uh, just as much as the Calandro Institute actually contacted us. Uh, they do want to do a presentation. And whoever is in the New York area, I'll let you know the date. We're going to do a presentation of the anthologies uh, officially at the Calandro Institute of uh, CUNY. So you can participate and be part of the you know, presentation. But what I am saying is that the major associations are only concerned either by the academics or about all the other stuff. The regular middle of the road riders are ignored. They still are, they always were ignored. They still are. We try, we, we try our best. You know, Joe Giordano writes books, Baloney writes books, Tony Vitano writes books. All these people are writing, but it's not enough to write books. You, you wrote your beautiful memoir. I think your memoir in particular, Gilda, should be in the Italian-American women's curriculum in college. I think it should be. I, mm -hmm. I mentioned it to CUNY, uh, being ignored. I will mention it again. What I'm saying is that we can only tell people we are not, we are not as, a, as a company, we are not financially stable enough to do the marketing that is necessary and the politics that is necessary to be going around. Well, you know, there was also another item. These anthologies were born at the beginning of COVID. So I finished my anthology <laughs> Uh, number two and three in the, in the COVID stage. I actually was one of the few people that got it at the beginning and I was sick for a while. It, it was very hard. I, I couldn't do any presentations of the ontologies until now, basically. So that, that's also an impediment that is not anybody's fault, but, you know, just happened that way. And we're going to try to do more. This is just the first step stone, actually. It's the second because we had one live at the Yonkers Public Library uh, a few months ago, but it's a uh, first official Zoom presentation is gonna be on YouTube. And if you do know associations that you can contact, you can send me the information, I'll gladly talk to them. And that's all we can do. We, we, we um, for my part as an editor, I can do all the work, all the footwork to put people together, to edit the stuff making sure it's properly edited, making sure it's properly presented. I will gladly, gladly meet with the members of any association if they want to cooperate. That's as far I can go. After that, it's still the steps have to be taken by the associations. They have to, they have to open up to the cultural aspect of Italian Americans, not only to the social aspect, because most of the association is still concerned about having dinner, dance, sandwiches, and, 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 and all these other beautiful things, that, which I love myself, having bingo, or whatever it is, that's great. But where is the culture in the association? I mean, they want to play cards. You go down to Brooklyn and the association, they want to play cards and have a glass of wine. That is a social club, but they, the name of the club is cultural. Cultural, what does that mean? It's, you know, I mean, it, it, it is a very touchy subject for me because I worked with this in, this idea from 1990 when I took over the, as the editorial director of the magazine. And we did a lot of work, a lot of footwork in Brooklyn and Queens. And until I had my partner who was in Florida now, local, it was a lot easy because he was inserted in the community there. But as soon as you step out, they forget about the culture. They go back, the association go back to doing only what's convenient. Because culture sometimes is difficult. You know, people, you know, it's like seeing a difficult movie versus seeing a cartoon, you know. It's a lot easier to see a cartoon or to see a comedy than to see a difficult movie. But culture is, is, is it's essential 
to bring our roots back to where they belong. So people know that we are here. People know that there's Jill DeLore Baldessari, there's Joe Giordano, there's Elizabeth Valone, Tony Vitano, and Mary Rohr, all these people that do a great job and need to be recognized and need to be rewarded, not necessarily financially because you know the financial aspect is the secondary, but they need to be rewarded. People have to buy books. If people don't buy books, you can do all the footwork you, you want in the world. People say, I love this book. Did you buy it? No. Did you read it? No. Okay. <laughs> That's all I can, I can summarize. I don't know what they mean, but when they say, I love these books, they love the cover. They love the back cover. I don't know. They love the color. I'm not <laughs> sure. You know, people don't read. People are starting to be absorbed by these, uh, you know, these little telephones and the internet and they do not read. They don't read poetry. I mean, you remember, Gilda, you're a slightly older than me, right? A slightly, a couple of years. You remember when you were young, I mean, poetry was taught in school. You had to declamate poetry. It was essential. Now they don't do that anymore. It's not, it's not important. Poetry is not important. Why? Poetry is essential. And, and, and so on and so forth. The culture is getting lost and because of technology. And we, we as a group have to, as Italian Americans, have to carry this around. We have to carry the torch, help each other. You know, people don't realize if we don't help each other as writers, we're not competing with each other, really. You know, what I write, Joe, you write different type of books that I write. Gilda, you write different type of books. Valona, same thing, Elizabeth, you write different type of books. We're not competing, really. We should help each other. And this is the concept behind the anthology, helping each other, letting you know, people know there are good Italian-American writers out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Back to Alison, whoever else wants to talk. Yes, Could I, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, is there time for a quick comment? Uh, just tying uh, back to, uh, to Columbus. You know, as everyone on, on this uh, Zoom knows, uh, Italians were discriminated against uh, when the big wave of Italian immigration was happening at the end of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. And uh, Italians banded together and uh, decided that they needed to show Americans that, uh, you know, Italians really had, just as this discussion we've just been uh, uh, having, uh, Italians had a major contribution to world culture. So statues like Columbus were, were funded and erected uh, for that purpose. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's lost in all this uh, controversy about Columbus and others, but based on the, the discussion that I've just been listening to, um, the, the same issues uh, are with us today, which is to keep putting forward the contribution of Italians and Italian Americans mm -hmm to the culture of the world. Thank you. And I would like to uh, comment that um, my mother was able to give her memoir, Piano published, Gilda Promised Me, to the um, Cardinal Parolin, who is the Secretary of State of the Vatican, to give to Pope Francis on our Copa Mayo trip organized by Basil Russo to Rome in May, so uh, hopefully these Italian American stories can also make their way uh, to Italy for Italians to read about the Italian American experience. And it was a joy for me and my mother to be in the first anthology together. And um, we really have been writing a lot and have been grateful to Tiziano to spearhead the first edition with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you might yes. want to ask Alison, you might want to ask Elizabeth alone about her story. She wants to tell what her experience with her story too, because we, we seem to have uh, forgotten her so, there for a while. 
Yeah, I will. I, I know we have a few in the chat. So I know earlier Patricia had a question. I didn't know if she still wants to talk. And Marianne had her hand raised, and as well as with Elizabeth. Just, I know this is an amazing conversation. We have so many mm -hmm. amazing contributions here. <laughs> well, my question was actually about the story that Joe uh, was talking mm -hmm. about. He said something about maybe they they were involved in something overseas that they didn't want to bring to America. Uh, my grandparents all came from Italy, and we have no no contact with anyone in that country on both sides. Some came from Sicily, some came from Naples, and my sister said maybe that was it. Maybe they were escaping from something and they broke their ties, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe just the fact that they couldn't read and write, so they couldn't write down anything or write to the people in the other country. So we have lost contact with our family. Mm -hmm. in Italy and and it's sad that it only the memories of myself my sister very few all my aunts and uncles are gone my parents are gone my grandparents are gone and once we're gone our history's gone so it, it it's sad mm -hmm. so uh I think I, I'd like to to say something about what you just said you know we have to differentiate different generations for immigrants when you're talking about uh, your grandparents you're talking about two generations back when they came, a lot of them wanted to forget about Italy because they, you know, they came in a period where they saw a lot of ugliness, either because, uh, you know, the, the government uh, was was abusing somehow the system in the south um, or whatever. You know, there was there was at that time there in South, like some parts of Sicily, there was uh, mafia killings. I know someone, for example, that. Uh, her mother never wanted to go back because she actually saw somebody being killed in front of her house. Um, now, dramatic as it may be, not all those cases are, but a lot of them, because they didn't want to remember the poverty, the lack of jobs, they brought them to the United States, those two generations ago. Now, the generations maybe of your parents or, or maybe even my generations came for different reasons. Uh, if they don't want to go back, there might be hidden stories behind them. But a lot of times it's because truthfully, your roots a lot of times are where your parents are. When your parents disappear, you tend to lose some of the uh, appeal. Of, of, of your country, not to say, let's say you lose your parents in Italy, you, you don't love Italy anymore, but you don't feel at home as if you, when your parents were there. And some of the people lost all their relatives, you know, either because of age or because they don't know who they were, and you don't want to go back anymore because of that. Not necessarily because of a crime, but because it's not your Italy. It's not your Italy anymore. You, you may love the country, but it is not your country anymore. That's why you, you became an American. It's a controversial, being both Italian in America and an American in Italy, I can tell you, is a very controversial feeling. Uh, being an immigrant, it, it leaves a mark in you for the rest of your life because you belong everywhere, you belong nowhere. Because you're always a stranger to somebody in the room, wherever you go. Because when you're in the United States, Oh yeah, he's, he's Italian, you know, he's, he's really an immigrant. When you go over there, oh, he's an American, you know, he lives there, you know, he thinks differently. And it's true because you are influenced by all these, by both societies, by both customs. Seems Mr. DeSena has frozen. <laughs> uh... Alison, you hear me? We lost yes, Allison? now. Oh, was I lost? I don't know. Yes. Okay. We're back. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> back to you, Allison. Yes. Sorry. I uh, I froze briefly. I think, but uh, yes. yes, absolutely. Okay. So now I believe so. Marion had hand her hand raised, and then if like you said, Mr. Sutton, if Elizabeth wanted to share briefly about her story. Good evening. Um. Some very, very compelling points, all definitely food for thought. When I started um, teaching and in my later career started writing and I wrote by accident, 
the situation in my life. My brother said, if you don't write about this, you're crazy. I did. Um, and that resulted in two different projects that continue to get produced and are seen. Having said that, being on the producing end, um, more so than the acting end in a sense, in terms of the hustle, like I tell people all the time, reach out to the to the to the colleges, look at who the professors are, send them an email, ask them, can you guest lecture in their classes? Even if it's just a 10 minute lecture, and then the, the, the students can catch up with you at the end of the class, or maybe you can offer, you know, a two-part series. I always say you never want to work for free but at least to kind of get the word out about either your work or somebody else's work and just making those connections. One of the reasons I mentioned uh, David Pope from the General So Pope Foundation, he, the General So Pope Foundation's reach is huge. He actually co-produced a documentary for PBS most recently about the Italian American experience. And I've said to people, don't be afraid to produce your own work. Pola Chaz Palmiteri rent a small theater, the Producers Club in New York, put a symposium together of five writers and invite people to come and generate, generate your work out there. Definitely, there's grants out there. There's the, the New York uh, Council for the Arts, Westchester Council for the Arts. There are grants for writers. There are grants for performers. You could just as easily, if you are writing, go ahead and get a professional reader in to read your work and get it heard. The biggest thing is you've written it, get, get it heard as best as you are able. And that usually starts on the local level, the schools, the libraries, cultural institutions, and then start going from there into those bigger arenas where, you, where we're all connected with each other. The idea of having one big database for Italian American writers, authors, playwrights, musicians is wonderful because so much of our history is carried forward that way. But I, I always say, if you have the time, take a look at the, just for example, I think, I think it's Professor Maldonado over at Westchester Community College. Angelina's Restaurant hosts Joan Adnolfi Mallory, who speaks a lot about opera. She's one of the number one Italian teachers on the planet. It's just finding those connections. There's not enough out there. So if we put ourselves out there, connect with each other, start those email chains and get and get and keep the dialogue going as best as we're able. I mean, you could do a symposium in San Martino's restaurant on Jackson Avenue. You'll, you'll pack the place. It sounds like a crazy venue to, to say you would do a symposium, but they, they, they have Monday night events and they're huge. And it's just a way to get to know each other and get each other's work out there. It's just a thought. You know, it all goes back to community. Like with this, the conversation we've had of supporting and uplifting the voices of Italian American writers, artists, creators, and uh, just sharing their stories and uh, uplifting that community. Absolutely. Now, the, the, just to add something, we're going to have an anthology number four. So uh, for your writers, I'm, I'm letting you know, I am not accepting submissions yet because I, would, I have to complete some other project for the end of the year. But in the springtime, we're going to open up again. You, if you are one of the writers, you're going to receive an email, read your email when you come from me. I will send you a submission form. And if you didn't write the story that you would fit in the anthology, do it now. You got time and perfect it by then. Because we want to continue with uh, this beautiful concept of uh, you know anthologies of Italian American writers. And we, you know, we we are gonna try to meet different places. Um, whether via Zoom or directly, so that we can present each and every writer from these you know, anthologies to the public, because that's the concept behind it. 
it's not only to belong to an anthology, you're belonging to a different community now. And, and this gives you, should give you an extra edge. It should give you a way to introduce yourself to maybe different communities to which you're not used to. Okay. Um, I, I believe, Marion, what's your last name? Uh, my last name is Penzero, okay. originally Penziere. Okay, good. Anyway, there, there, there is also two other writers here, I believe, uh, Elizabeth Vallon. We are over the time, so it's up to you, Alison. Uh, if you want uh, Elizabeth to say a couple of minutes on a story, to say uh, something about the story. Yeah, I think a few. Elizabeth, I mean, you feel up to it? Yeah, if you're up to it, Elizabeth, that's perfectly fine. Oh, uh, you are muted. We don't hear you. You're muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, before I talk about my work, I just wanted to say one thing to Patricia, that uh, the conditions at the beginning of the 1900s when the Italians came were so awful. I have one branch of the family that changed their name from Palombella to Pambello. They didn't want to squash their Italian heritage, but they wanted to facilitate people being able to call their name. Now on my husband's side of the family, they never knew anything about anything. We don't know where we came from. We don't, we don't know anything about anything. Uh, and then my mother-in-law died and I, received a lot of, uh, my husband was an only child, so we got everything she had. And I was going through this, the information and I found out where they came from originally. I found out many, many, many things. I think at the beginning of the 1900s, people just did not want to talk about being Italian, even around World War II. They just, they were Italian, but you know, they didn't want to highlight it. Okay, uh, I, that's what I wanted to say to Patricia. About my works, um, my works generally are historical fiction. Um, and usually what happens is I get struck by a bolt of lightning and <laughs> I start writing. <laughs> Uh, I went to Italy the first time to meet my uh, father's family and they took me to this place called Castel del Monte in uh, Andrea in uh, southern Italy and uh, I was introduced to a fellow by the name of Frederick von Hohen, Frederick uh, Hohenstaufen. Emperor Frederick was the uh, uh, Holy Roman Emperor. And I fell so in love with him and his mother that I ended up uh, writing a book about his mother. I wanted people to know about his mother. There's stuff on Frederick, but not about his mother. And she was a very important person in her own right. But, you know, they didn't really tout uh, the achievements of women or the position of women in the Middle Ages. Then in the, uh, my second historical fiction book, Heaven, Hell, and Hoboken, uh, that was, uh, uh, came out of my uh, family lore that um, they would always say, oh, grandpa was uh, sent back to Italy when World War I uh, erupted. And I really didn't understand why, and they really couldn't under explain to me why. And then, I learned about the uh, process of kicking people out during World War I. Um, they were called slackers. They were just, they were told they were slackers. In my grandfather's case, he didn't immediately volunteer to fight because his brothers were all in Italy fighting and he didn't uh, wanna get on a battlefield and have to face his brother. But, I uh, wove a story about Hoboken, the Italians in Hoboken, what was going on at the time with the various ethnic groups that were fighting each other 
for prominence in the town. The town originally was a totally German town. So the Irish and the Italians were really, they had a, a real battle. And um, I, I've done a, a couple of works of historical fiction. I've uh, done most recently a nonfiction book about a uh, very interesting African-American. Um, it's what, like I said, I get struck with a bolt, a bolt of lightning and it's like, oh, this is what I want to do and I want to do it now. <laughs> and um, it is difficult to promote the works in the associations. I went to an association meeting last month. I sat down and what was everybody talking about? How they make their dough. Well, I make my dough this way and she makes her dough that way. It's like, Oh, shoot me already. <laughs> because there's so many things we can talk about. It's an Italian organization and we're talking about dough. Um, so uh, I can't thank Tiziano enough for doing these Zooms. I think they're so important. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, in your case, I have, to, I have to add something to what Elizabeth said because I edited those two books that she's talking, she's referring to. And uh, I was surprised when I read the first one, Barbarossa's Princess, because I realized um, that in those times, believe it or not, it was not the father that influenced the child early years because the father was never there. You're talking about uh, someone that would go to war, uh, you know, a prince, or in, in this case was a prince, a heir to an empire who would be at the battle all the time, and the son was with the mother. So the mother was the main influence. So we have one of the greatest emperor. And when I say greatest emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, greatest in the sense that he brought culture to Italy. He's the, one of the most cultured human beings of his time, and it's all because of his mother. So the story behind that book, it's fantastic in that sense because it focuses on the fact is that we have a great emperor, but why? Because the mother was there. She was a culture, she was educated, and she educated him. She made him a star. She made him the most important emperor of the time. Um, and the second book, it's fantastic for different reasons. Um, but this is what happens, you know, it's not only you, Elizabeth. I read, I read some of your books, you know, we, we should do a book exchange, by the way, you know, uh, between us writers, because you should read each other uh, to see exactly, like we say, we are not competing, but to see exactly which, which niche do we belong to. And so we can help each other with that. So uh, back to you, Alison, otherwise I'm taking over again. <laughs> No, not at all. This was this was great. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, thank you, Mr. Senna and all the authors here and everyone for contributing. Uh, I think we had a great conversation a lot about the Italian American experience, uh, creating that community, which was a goal of this anthology to create a community of writers to uplift those works. And here we had our community here tonight of Italian Americans, you know, sharing their experiences and, you know, continuing to uplift that community. Um, as we approach 8.30, I don't know if there's any like final comments or questions, um, or if you had anything else you want to say just before we uh, wrap up for the night. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment as well. Um, during the pandemic, in addition to writing, I reconnected with my former conductor of the Greater Prince and Youth Orchestra, and his name is Maestro Matteo Gemario, and we spoke a little bit about war veterans and my contribution to the first anthology was a better veteran and an inspirational story about how he overcame adversity of what happened to him in the war and then gave back to other veterans. But Matteo Gimario and I have collaborated on about 13 songs. I'm a songwriter and write the music and lyrics and he composes the arrangement. And we've had many sessions that have been just wonderful as former teacher and student. 
and I've written about that. Um, kind of like a Tuesdays with Maury, like Mondays with Mateo <laughs> um, essay. And I shared it with him and he was very touched and he's just been wonderful, uh, both as a patriot, as a World War II, 97 year old veteran who's still so engaged in music and creativity. And in fact, I think he should write about himself if, if he were able, but I've tried to do a little bit about my impressions with him. And it would be interesting to write maybe a little bit more about Italian American war veterans. Um, well, well uh, Mary, you said something magic there. He should be writing about himself, but he's not capable. Uh, and that's where we step in, the friends, the family, the people that are capable, capable of extracting this information from these people and writing for them. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, you know, you see there is, there is a um, lecture that we, we uh, recorded a few months ago about writing memoirs, in which we also talk about your mother's book. But the, the, the fact is that uh, the people uh, in our community who are able to write should also help other people one way or the other. So they, with this um, magic information from people does not get lost. Because every time something gets lost, it's very, very important. It leaves a mark on society. We need to keep these memories alive. And maybe I'll talk with you later about um, more ideas to write about him and what should. what should be. Yes. Thank you.